um, as we go to intersections here, this one looking at um, alternative working spaces and studio spaces and living spaces for artists. Um, I just wanted to start by acknowledging that the AGO sits on the traditional territories of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the credit, um, and that this territory is subject to the um, Dish with One Spoon Welcome Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Anishinaabe Free Fires Confederacy and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy to peaceably share and care for resources around the Great Lakes. Um, this territory is also subject to a treaty between the Government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and we want to just acknowledge that uh, Toronto is still home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Um, yeah, so I'm Adrian. I'm a librarian here at the AGO. Um, this project is a partnership between the AGO Library, which is not in this room, but just down the hall. Uh, if you go straight down the hall, next to the doors that go up to the park, we're located there. And we are open Tuesdays to Saturdays, one to five, and open till eight on Wednesdays, and open to the public. So um, hopefully you have a chance to come in, do research, look at art books. We have stuff that supports the AGO collection, Canadian art, contemporary art, historical art, um, special collections. We have archival collections, artist books, uh, tons of really amazing stuff. Um, and open free to the public during those hours. Um, we're partnered with the last, the Artist Legal Advice Services to come in this talk, and the Center for Emerging Artists and Designers at Oakhead University. So I'm gonna pass on to Miles first from the Center for Emerging Artists and Designers to tell you a little bit about their organization. Okay. And you need a microphone here, yes. Siva. <laughs> Center for Emerging Artists and Designers. Just want to acknowledge my colleague Shelley, who's here as well, and uh, helped contribute a lot to helping this event get off the ground now in its second session of four. Um, the Center for Emerging Artists and Designers, which is a neighbor to Oakhead University at 115 McCall Street, the corner of McCall and Dundas, our brand new building, and our center is up on the third floor and will be the host for the next two events. We support all current students and alumni with their career success through a number of services and programs. Um, and uh, out of curiosity, who uh, from the audience is from the OCAD community today? Great. Well, if you are a current student or recent grad, please make yourself aware of services that might still be available to you. Um, and for those who will return in September for our third event in the series, it will be hosted at our center. And that discussion will be on September 25th. It will be an intro to artist contracts. But I thank you all for coming today. I'm really looking forward to this iteration. I'm going to turn it over to Daniel from Alas. Thank you. Thanks, Miles. Uh, so, hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Pink. I'm on the board of Artist Legal Advice Services. Uh, I'm also the chair of our kind of events and community outreach and partnership committee. <coughs> Uh, and so really excited to be back at the AGO for our second installment in our four-part series. Uh, we've put together a fantastic panel tonight uh, that are really going to hopefully provide some great insight and suggestions and thoughts on um, working and living in this city that can be quite difficult uh, when, when things are so expensive. So really looking forward to getting their thoughts on this. Uh, a bit about Alas. So we're a service that's been around for about 32 years at this point. Uh, we are based in Toronto, and what we do is we provide free legal information uh, and some advice to artists uh, living in Ontario. Uh, so we do this by three primary means. One, we uh, run workshops and panels such as this one, where you can come out and learn all about legal issues. Uh, two, we have... we. We have a website that's currently being redeveloped. And once that redevelopment is complete in the next couple of months, there's going to be a whole whack of great resources re-put up on the website uh, that'll be really easily accessible, that website being uh, alasontario.ca. Uh, um, it might be on your handout. It is. So if you can't remember, it's on the handout. Um, so there's going to be all sorts of great things there. We've been streaming and uh, creating uh, videos of all our past panels as well. So 
We have like four or five already that will be available out there on a whole whack of topics. So lots of great content for you to check out on the new website. Uh, and finally, you can sign up through the website for uh, a free legal consult with one of our specialized entertainment lawyers. We can come in and get 30 minutes of free legal uh, information and advice about a problem you're facing uh, on pretty much any topic you can really think of. Uh, again, so you can find more information about that on our website uh, and you can actually sign up on the website. It will be a lot easier to sign up once our new website is all spiffy and released, but for now, feel free to sign up on the website. Um, and before I turn it over to the panel, I just want to introduce our moderator, who then will introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, Elena Kolasichuk, uh, on our, my far right, at your left, is an entertainment not-for-profit and pri privacy lawyer at Taylor Klein, no, Taylor Obala Murray and Leyland LLP. It's an entertainment law firm in the city. Um, when she's not practicing law there, she is an accomplished writer and director of theater. Um, and when she's not directing or writing theater, she sits on the board of the most amazing organization called the theater, Paprika Theater Festival, which is a youth training festival uh, for kids ages uh, 18 to 26 who are interested in getting involved in theater. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Elena to allow her to introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be around after the panel, as will uh, our co-hosts. If anyone has any questions for us, please feel free to come have a chat with us after. Thanks very much, Elena. Thanks, Dan. Can everyone hear me okay? Hello, good to see all of you tonight. So I'm gonna start by introducing our three panelists for tonight. So to my immediate left, and pardon me for reading, but I don't wanna miss anything really good here. Um, we have Dave Sorbara. Dave is a founding partner of mu music production company, Grayson Matthews. Dave has spent more than 20 years producing music for film and television. But with his latest venture, Signal, his focus has turned to supporting creators in the music and sound industry by providing access to creative spaces, studios, and key services that they need to succeed. Thanks for being here with us, Dave. And next today, we have Jordana Wright. Jordana is the managing director of Activate Space. Activate Space started as an extension of Jordana's doctoral work on legal and financial strategies for transforming underutilized properties, and it has since grown since that time into a full-service place-making firm operating across the GTA and Hamilton, I believe, as well. Welcome, Jordana. Great to have you here. And at the end of the table, the other lawyer at the table is Ryan Martin. Ryan is a lawyer practicing in commercial and residential real estate law, commercial leasing, and landlord-tenant law. He also has a specialized practice in co-housing and co-op housing law. He is a legal consultant for Co-Living Canada and a member of the Toronto Lawyers Association and the Urban Land Institute. Thanks for being here, Ryan. So how we envisioned tonight going was um, we'd like to start with some opening remarks from each of the panelists. Um, so after that, we have some questions that we can suggest as, uh, as other talking points, but we'd really like to open it up to the floor as much as possible and to hear questions and thoughts from, from all of you who have, have come here tonight. So to begin, if you could each start with sharing some opening comments, and we'll start with you, Dave, um, on your thoughts on the challenges that artists face in the city here in Toronto or surrounding areas, finding appropriate and affordable working and living spaces. Thank you. Um, nice to be here and be part of this conversation, first and foremost. Um, I think probably the best way that <coughs> put my remarks down is kind of give you a little bit of the background that I was telling these guys uh, before we got started. And really, I spent 20 years in the music industry, and the number of changes that have happened over the last two decades or more in the music industry. Um, I worked in a business where every year it was like you wake up on January 1st and, and like, okay, what's our business model this year? Because the world's completely changed and we got to figure it out. It feels like every year we've been constantly trying to figure out what the next iteration of our music business was in order to um, really meet the challenges on a, on a yearly basis to try to you know, build a profitable company. Um, you know, we were great at ebb and, ebbing and flowing, but as, as I was telling these guys, uh, about five years ago, we purchased a, a piece of real estate in downtown Toronto in an empty lot, thinking we were going to scale into this Disney-esque 
music production company. And um, long story short, it didn't work out. But the business is still around, but really the real estate was proof that um, there was so much value to bringing people together in a shared experience, especially with music and sound. Spaces were disappearing at an alarming rate in the city. And we ended up having a very large piece of real estate that was outfitted with a lot of capacity to house a lot of different people beyond just our single company. And really, we decided a few, few years ago to come up with a model that would really allow the community access to our space and then hopefully develop a model and a concept that we could then scale to really provide more of these type of spaces. But really, the way I've, I've always described it is um, trying to get more people through less space. And culturally, the music industry, we all grew up, or at least people of my vintage grew up thinking, if I can make it one day, I'll own my own studio and I can sit there and light that candle I always want to light and have the speakers I want, always want to have. And I think we've been trying to usher in a new era of um, letting go of that notion of having your own space, but um, sharing that space, because collaboration and creativity are kind of go exponentially better when you have more people and more energy in a focus space. So um, I think there's still massive real estate challenges that we're all facing, but I think a bigger challenge also is um, really educating people, especially in the music sandwich community as so well, on effective ways of collaborating, productivity, how to use real estate properly, not just use it in the traditional sense, change the paradigm of what a recording studio is, um, it's not a big giant board with a window and um, it's, it's, it's a different animal these days, so it's really changing that entire paradigm. So a um, long way to go, but I think we're, you know, I think we have an interesting way at it. Thanks. Looking forward to hearing much more about that. Jordana. Um, well, affordable space, as we all know, is a huge issue for artists in the city of Toronto. And interestingly, something that many people don't realize is at the same time, there are a ton of properties that just sit vacant or underutilized. So what Activate Space does is it tries to, well, it succeeds in opening up um, vacant and underutilized properties to broad community use through all sorts of creative collaborations and legal arrangements. And it provides affordable spaces for artists. It creates food business incubators and does pop-ups and all kinds of cool projects. So um, I'll probably be focusing today's discussion around um, some of the large institutional properties that I'm currently uh, leading the transformation of, which are uh, United Church campuses that are being turned into community hubs across the east end of Toronto. So I'm actively working with um, emerging artists and larger artist collectives to get them in the spaces, come up with agreements that work for them, and then also work for the churches who are facing all kinds of property-related challenges and are just looking to essentially just meet their sustainability goals. So they're not your typical private sector landlord who is for profit at minimum. They're looking to reach sustainability, which opens up interesting possibilities for artists like you all. So I'm going to be focusing on that. But I also do a ton of projects with uh, vacant storefronts, mostly along the lakeshore and Etobicoke. And Vacant storefronts and distressed retail areas is another huge thing. And uh, I do a few projects in residential areas um, in high-rise communities that are spatially isolated and they'd like to bring vibrant uses and artist communities to their spaces to activate them, to animate them, to set up businesses, to do pop-ups. And these are, again, sometimes free spaces, sometimes they're practically free spaces, and other times they cost a little bit just below market, but they're helping a community asset reach its sustainability goals. So that's what I'll be speaking to you guys about today. Thank you. And Ryan. Uh, thank, uh, thank, Jordan. thank Jordan for that. I would, I would say um, that just to contribute to what uh, uh, both you and Dave have just said is that it's about finding um, it's about finding interesting ways to use property that's traditional uh, and being, being as open-minded about it as possible. And uh, prior to me practicing law, I was an artist. I, I, was, a, I was a working musician for uh, eight years. Uh, and some of the challenges around being a working musician involved so many agreements, so many ideas about how to 
structure not only the way in which music is disseminated, but also the way in which you house yourself as a musician. So uh, the challenges that I saw as a musician were the things that inspired me to go to law school to try and solve some of those problems. Um, and uh, uh, that's what I decided to do back in 2012. Um, and uh, my firm now focuses on uh, not just real estate in the traditional sense, there's definitely uh, elements of traditional real estate that we do, but a big part of what my time is spent on is, is figuring out ways to make it affordable for, for individuals who are in the city trying to either buy property or to, uh, to, to just find a tenancy that would be favorable to them with favorable terms. Um, so, uh, you know, that's what my, my, major, uh, my major objectives are as a lawyer, and I would say now, uh, here tonight, I mean, I'm sure that some of you are finding the challenges uh, about, there, there are definitely challenges that you're facing regarding your tenancy, regarding what it's like and how affordable it is to, to live in the city or to buy property in the city, but uh, it's important to keep an open mind about the possibility that even if you're an artist, you can not only have a healthy tenancy, you can also possibly consider the possibility of, of buying property with other artists, with other individuals that uh, uh, you know uh, work in your work in your specific area. It's uh, and that's the idea. Is that I'm, I'm hoping that we can discuss some of those creative ways of using property here tonight. Thanks, Ryan. I think before we dive into some specific questions, it'd be really great to hear who is here tonight and maybe a little bit about your work and any issues that are on your mind in terms of living and working spaces in Toronto. Should we pass around the mic for that? Yeah, either pass the mic around or repeat the question. I'll pass the mic. Start with you. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Anil. Um, I came to Toronto just a few years ago. I worked as a commercial media producer in the Caribbean, in Trinidad, and um, producing mostly uh, documentary film work, uh, a lot of um, uh, stuff for TV and radio throughout the Caribbean. And I was hoping, when I came to Toronto, the, the vibrancy of the artists here, um, it, I, I don't get that in Trinidad, the diversity. So I was just really hoping to connect with people like-minded, like myself, and set up something like what you guys have at, at studio, uh, what you're describing at Signal. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Hi, um, so my partner and I are both artists in Peterborough. So we came here tonight just to learn a little more about alternative studio spaces since there's a big lack of rental opportunities in Peterborough. Um, it's funny, like the small town, it's all the same issues as the big, the big cities. Um, it's all, all the sort of available spaces are going to um, restaurants and you know, little things that are there for six months and then they sit vacant. So it's, it's it'll be nice to maybe have a bit of better understanding of how to get into that. Thanks for making the check down. Uh, <coughs> hi, um, I think we're here for the same reason, just a general yeah. curiosity yeah. moving forward about studio space. And what is your artistic practice? Yeah. Hi, my, uh, my name is Imelda. I, I consider myself a hobby artist, but actually I rented a garage workshop in the Moss Park area, which I operated for about seven years as a kind of like a gallery garage for like, uh, you know, like uh, emerging artists. So I was lucky because the landlord allowed me to live in, work in the space, and I paid about $600 a month. But then the building was bought, and then I had to move out. Um, but I think if spaces like that, where you can live and work, um, and also show sometimes, were more like available, like from in the old area, uh, I think some artists would really be able to be able to practice because it's a really affordable to be able to live and work in a space. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Mike. I'm a photographer. And I'm uh, just here to learn more about any options because <coughs> real estate is so expensive in Toronto. Yeah, pretty new to this topic. So. Thank you. <laughs> no pressure. You're all welcome. Hi, my name is Oliver, and, and this is Janet. We work uh, with an organization called Akin, um, and we're both practicing artists as well. Um, Akin provides studio space and um, uh, co-working for creative people across the city. Hi, my name's Ryan. I'm an artist and designer. Um, just working out of a home studio right now and kind of getting ready to make the leap to looking for uh, like a formalized studio space, so we just want to come here and get some more information. Hi, my name is Lucy and I'm from Australia. I happen to be here on a three-week holiday through Canada for my first time. I, hello. It's been very welcoming, it's been wonderful. I um, work as a marketing consultant and I was actually researching the latest about Albert Namajira. You might have heard that his family, he's the best known Aboriginal landscape painter in Australia. And his rights to his estate were taken away. And for eight years, his four generations have been fighting to get him back. So when I return, relax him with a lot of new information. Um, I want to contribute to finding how to prevent this from happening and what kind of remedies the current government is willing to um, establish. And I was interested in if there's an international court of arbitration for big cases like those. Um, so, thank you. I'm not a real life artist, but I've been a volunteer for, uh, for um, the art gallery for several, several years, and my interest is um, in art, so I saw the topic and thought I'd find out what it's all about. Hi, my name is Eliza. I'm a visual artist. Uh, at the moment, I am coordinating a group of 42 photographers, and every May we want to have exhibition space in Toronto. So it's we've been doing it for a long time, not the same 42 people, but a revolving group. And over the last five or six years in particular, it's gotten very competitive to get space. You have to book space, you know, a year in advance to get exhibition <coughs> space. The price is going up, you know, and meanwhile, people's incomes aren't going up. And the artists, some of the artists in our group have moved out of the city because it's too expensive to stay in the city, but the ones that are still here, you know, people don't want to pay a fortune for the exhibition space because, um, you know, other costs are high and incomes are low. So the reason I'm here, I think, is, is just to get my mind working about, you know, should be, we be looking more at, you know, pop-up kind of exhibitions instead of more of a formal rent a space for two weeks, you know, keep it going for that long. So I'm very interested, I think, in what Jordana was doing, and I want to hear more about that. Hi, I'm uh, Catherine. I'm at the Faculty of Music and the University of Toronto, and I work on projects about how the music industry connects with urban planning. Hi, my name is Manoia. I'm an emerging uh, painter and art teacher, and I'm really just here because I don't really know what I don't know. <laughs> so. That's a good reason to be here. Hi, I'm Anna. Um, I go to OCAD. I'm an emerging practicing artist, and I'm also a community organizer. 
And during the summer, I get a taste of what it's like to try to work without a studio space because in, during the school year, I just use OCAT's facilities, but in the summer, I find it really hard. Um, so we're here to learn. Hello, I'm Meek. Um, I'm pretty multidisciplinary, but I've been moving into performance art and live art, and a lot of movement stuff, uh, which can be very hard, because uh, there's not a lot of space <laughs> to do said movement. Um, yeah, I've also found that uh, a lot of times uh, people that are practicing art are legally not, or are told they're legally not allowed to practice their art in their homes. I've seen that on contracts and things like that. Um, so. I'm just, I'm really interested in what Jordana, Jordana is doing. Um, yeah, just looking at alternative places to play with the space and, and uh, yeah, make the most out of our city. Hello, my name is Gabriela. I'm an Argentinian graphic designer and artist, visual artist. Uh, I'm in holidays too, um, but I am in an exploration trip too because I want to live here in Canada. So um, I think that this, uh, this meeting matches specifically with my doubts. So that's why I'm here. I'm very interested, in, uh, very interested in, in what you have to say to me and to other people about this because, well, uh, I, I am noticing that living here is very expensive and I want to um, realize how how could I do. Well thank you all for being here and for the two vacationers for squeezing us in. Extra <laughs> appreciation. Um, but of course we're gonna hear lots of great advice and suggestions and maybe lessons learned from our panelists, but also really great to meet um, a great mix of, of people in the room as well and maybe there'll be opportunities later to connect and support each other later on. Something that we're hearing from a few people are some living slash working environments. And I was actually going to turn to Ryan first. I thought maybe you could give us a primer or some sort of um, breakdown of how the law treats commercial versus resi residential spaces differently as it relates to the folks in the room. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, I'd say. Um, when you when you're beginning a tenancy one of the most important things to do is to look at what that relationship between you and that landlord is really like are you and and you need to be as clear as possible about your intentions being there I think that what happens is people move into spaces they feel like well I've got the tenancy I'm gone in as a as a residential tenant, so now I'm just gonna start doing what I intended to do work-wise. I'm gonna start painting, I'm gonna do what I do. And then uh, what can happen in that circumstance is when you're ready to make a complaint about it, a landlord can very easily turn around and say, well, you know, I mean, uh, we, we had an arrangement, we had an agreement, we had an understanding about what your intentions were here, you told me you are going to just live. Uh, it's it's looking more like, in fact, you're not living, you're, you're working as well, or maybe you're just working, we don't know. Um, that circumstance, I think, uh, when you feel a lot of trepidation about being honest on the front end, I think it's really important that you just address the issue right away and make sure that uh, uh, make sure that your landlord is aware that you're not only going to be living in a space, but you're also going to be working there, and that he's going to be okay with it. So that in the event that, let's say, you have an issue with, uh, for those of you who are painting, you have an issue with the oil paints and they're, and they're leaking out of your unit and the smell is going elsewhere, well, if a landlord has given you the authority to be in there as a, as a working artist living there as well, it's going to be quite, it's going to be a more favorable situation. So I would just say that to start on the front end. Uh, I would also say that um, what's important to keep in mind is that uh, there are a lot of rights that you're afforded as a residential tenant, and you want to try as best you can to preserve those rights uh, when you're when you're either looking for a place or you're living in a space uh, right now. Uh, and I can tell you that if you were to be 
living in a space and deemed to be living in that space for primarily, even though you may be doing some work on the side, you're still afforded a lot of rights under the Residential Tenancies Act, which is a very, very favorable position for you to be in. So you always want to uh, try to make the situation as favorable in that context. Uh, and to try and keep it so that you've got a residential tenancies, even a uh, residential tenants, tenancy, even though you're you may be working in the space. Uh, that all that to say, there's commercial tenancies as well. Uh, some of anybody in here have a commercial under a commercial lease right now? So living somewhere or not even living but working, living. Well, I, I Okay, and they end up living there, under, and it's a commercial, just a commercial lease that they sign. Yeah, so there's ups and downs to having a commercial tenancy like anything, but uh, kind of the upside is that you and your landlord can negotiate into that contract anything you want. I mean, you can, you can negotiate anything provided you're good at that and you're prepared to tell your landlord how you want things to be laid out. Uh, you could do almost anything. I mean, pets are allowed in certain commercial tenancies provided the zoning is allowed um, in the area they're living, for instance. Uh, pets are also allowed under Residential Tenancies Act. But people try to, there's a, there, there may be some hurdles and some challenges there, but that's just an example. There's also, the, I mean, the upside for you as a tenant may be that you can set, set the parameters so that they're as favorable as possible. Of course, the downside is if your landlord's a better negotiator than you, then you're kind of, you're in a bad situation, right? I mean, you, you, a, a landlord under a commercial tenancies uh, act uh, agreement can set virtually any term he'd like that uh, regarding rent, regarding the repayment of it, regarding the default of it, the consequences regarding the default. That's not the case under the Residential Tenancies Act. So you're afforded a lot more protections regarding rent and your ability to stay in your unit if you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you manage to secure a residential tenancy. So uh, all that to say, you know, try as best you can to, to maintain a residential tenancy and work on the work and make it, and make it, make it as obvious and as plain, plain as obvious as possible to your landlord that you're also going to be working in the space. That'd be my two cents. Can you take on a commercial tenancy in something that's otherwise being used for residential purposes? For example, you don't live in a space, but you rent a garage for your van or to create work in, but you don't reside there, or you rent a basement you know, within a building where others are residing, but that's not your use of the space. So you're going to use it as a commercial space, essentially. And go home to your home, which is separate. But you've got this relationship with this space. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming you're practicing out of your parents' basement. Is that? What you're doing? <laughs> I I mean I, I look I yes of course you could do that if you just uh, on the on the face of it I would say yes I mean that's doable. There are of course some issues that uh, surrounding not only just the relationship between you and your landlord but also your relationship with the city in that context. So if you're going to, you can establish a, a commercial tenancy with uh, the landlord of this building to say, yes, we're going to rehearse here between the hours of, uh, in the context of music, I mean, I know that there's some of you, but I would say, you know, you're going to use the space between the hours of, let's say, uh, you know, nine to eight at night, whatever. you can set that up, commercial tenancy, you intend not to live there, it's going to be very plain and obvious on the agreement that you have that you're going to say you're not going to live there. Uh, that's totally fine, but we have to be sensitive to the fact that you can't just, in the context of music, you can't just do that anywhere and create disturbances that bother other individuals. And so the, you, you only, you're not only in a relationship with this landlord, you're in a relationship with the city, in that you've got to make sure that the zoning that's mapped out is allowable. That is true, it's, it's, it's on the landlord to do that, maybe he offers you a tenancy, but if you're in breach of a zoning, or if you're in a zoning violation as a result of being in a specific area, you could be in a circumstance that would be fairly problematic. So, but to answer your question, yes, you could do that. 
Thanks, Ryan. And maybe I'll just throw one other kind of party in the mix to consider in these situations as well, which is your insurance company too, where it's really important to always have full disclosure about whatever activities you are carrying on, whether it's residential and you're operating a home-based business or it's a commercial space. And you know, many artists have lots of expensive equipment or tools or inventory, so you want to always disclose that to your insurer to make sure that you're covered. And especially if you're operating a business out of your home, those assets, those business assets would not normally be covered by your, your tenant's insurance. So it's really important to be up front and just make sure that you're, you're protected. Um, Jordana and Dave, anything to add about the relationship between living and working spaces and how that relates to, to your work? Um, so one of the things that I wanted to touch on is well, broadly related to um, the agreements that you can have with property owners. So we talked a bit about leases and how they operate in residential and commercial spaces. One of the tools that I often use is actually licensing agreements, which is a little bit different than a lease. You guys may have heard about licensing in terms of licensing your, your work, but I don't know, has anyone heard about licensing in terms of licensing space? You yeah. have? So what's your familiarity with licensing space? Oh, well, I've, I've looked in quite a lot into alternative music venues, and it's, so it's connected to that. Yeah. Okay, great. So. Um, I'll give you just like a quick overview of how this tool operates. It also, it opens up opportunities, but also creates some precarity depending on um, who you're working with. But, so in addition to a lease, you can also license space, which essentially doesn't confer an interest in land. It allows you a privilege of access to space to perform and act in legal terms. It sounds a little weird and a little bit of a small nuance, like a nuance difference, but so it allows you essentially to come into spaces like churches and you're not a tenant, like a capital T tenant, but you have an agreement with the church to perform an act in that space and that act might be um, helping them make their space more vibrant by setting up your gallery and having your workspace within their space and by having a licensing agreement, the property owner is often working together with you in the space, so you don't have exclusive possession of that space. It's kind of like being in a co-working space and your co-worker is your landlord and you're able to develop a lot of creative partnerships through this model, but it's also um, a revocable privilege. So if you don't set up strong legal protections, it's easier for the property owner to end those sorts of contracts. But just in addition to thinking about leases and licensing, leasing commercial and residential spaces, I think you guys should also look into licensing agreements around the space. Very neat. So, so just a question, is the primary purpose of a licensing agreement is just a short-term um, agreement that you can, that a landlord would typically do in order to accommodate a myriad of functions for a certain vacant space that they have? Is that really the idea of a, of a licensing agreement? So um, essentially a licensing agreement, it, it began as something that was used for more flexible arrangements, but when paired with proper contracts, you're able to allow it to um, protect you in more long-term arrangements, but oftentimes it's used by property owners who like these churches <coughs> that don't have a large amount of capital, but they have space, and they have a lot of operational challenges around refurbishing their space, and if there's a hole in the roof, what do you do? So they almost are able to trade in space through licensing agreements, so they're able to say, if you come in and you um, paint this room, then we'll give you access in these sorts of ways. So it's not a capital T tenancy, it's a way that churches often will use to help you trade in space and put a little bit of sweat equity into it, and. Um, I'm sure a lawyer can tell you more. I kind of hand off my agreements to lawyers to cross those T's, dot those I's. I mainly structure the deals and I do a lot of social procurement around connecting artists with um, these large institutions to put these agreements together. So it is something that started out as more so pop-ups. It's something that's commonly used if you're a hairdresser, let's say, and you're renting a chair in a salon. You're not a capital T tenant in that salon. You can't overstay, you're almost licensing a chair within someone else's space that owns or is the leaseholder of that space. So it's a it's a similar kind of arrangement that I'd encourage you all to explore that's 
kind of a, a lesser known legal tool. And how would someone try to explore those options? Is there somewhere, maybe <laughs> through you, where there's a list available of, of, of landlords that might be open to an arrangement like that? Or? Mm -hmm. So it's something that's often used by co-working spaces, but when you bring it to a landlord that's, one, not familiar with co-working, co-sharing, that kind of co-location arrangement, they might look at it and say, what, or what are you trying to do? What's, why do this instead of a lease? So it is something that not a lot of people are familiar with in a more traditional tenancy contract and, or traditional tenancy kind of arrangement. So I would encourage you to um, look towards models like co-working spaces, like <coughs> hair salons and um, things of that nature, co-working, co-sharing spaces, and find ways that you can adapt those approaches to meet your own needs along with proper legal support, obviously. But it isn't something that's well known and it's not something that you can just look up online and have like a boilerplate thing that you can print off and fill out. It's something that is emerging. It's something that I've been able to work in to open up a lot of these spaces to people. So happy to tell you more about it after, but I do encourage you to do your own research. Thank you. Dave, anything to add? Um, yeah, just, just anecdotally speaking of um, spaces, especially with musicians and music producers and, and uh, um, artists of that nature. You know, most of the people that we work with, if not all of those um, earners or the professionals, everyone operates at their, their home. They may work in a lot of different facilities, but I would say close to 100% of people have some home-based working setup, which is interesting, um, especially when you have to deal with sound, because sound does make noise, especially if you're thinking of common buildings or small apartments. So. But it's interesting that pretty much across the board, I think in order to make your career uh, work, your home base is part of the equation, always. Do you have a question about that? Yeah, I'm just wondering, <coughs> from the comments that John and Joanna talked about, um, is it similar to the uh, daycare in the church basement? Is that kind of similar? And the second part of it is uh, the implications for, because most churches are tax-free, I think. Yeah. So, um, so it's hard to tell from first from a first look or from the optics of someone being in a space what their legal arrangement is. There are some churches that do um, have leased uses on their properties, but what the licensing arrangement does is it also opens you up to some of the um, rules that operate within the church spaces. So if the church, for example, is open from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. and those are their hours. If you're, like, if you're leasing a space, usually your access to the space isn't time restricted. If you're leasing a storefront, you can kind of come and go in your storefront, unless it's within a mall, then you have to apply by mall hours, that sort of thing. But if you're licensing a space, then you can be in the space. You have your access to the space to perform your act, I guess. But um, you also have to abide by their hours. You have to neg negotiate about things like um, access arrangements and what that would look like. So it opens up a whole layer of negotiations and it allows them to uh, put additional um, considerations into your arrangement that again, it, it's hard to tell from just looking at someone in a space, whether the space is being leased by them or licensed by them. It's one of those things that sometimes it can get a little bit fuzzy and people can sometimes have licensing agreements act like leases, which can be legally very problematic as well. So sometimes you don't know until you ask someone. So. Any other questions from the floor at this time? Well, I have a question. Um, I think Jordana raised a really good point about um, well, and the background of negotiating is always difficult, whether we're advocating for ourselves to our insurer, to our landlord, to whoever, but all the more challenging when you're trying to bring a novel idea forward. Um, so really great to maybe be able to point to existing places as backup for your negotiating position, but I'd love to hear from our panelists about successes, failures, tips, whatever you may be able to, to share with the folks in the room about 
what we should know about negotiating, or how can we better advocate for ourselves while negotiating? Maybe we'll start with you, Dean Christian. Uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, I'm just going from experience. Um, so currently, we're running a space uh, with um, 147 members and growing, and most of these arrangements are on a membership basis, so it really falls into this co-working model. But it's very interesting. Um, while we've been um, developing our model, almost every single person that comes to the door has a unique need and want and desire. And, and uh, there's you know, a set of, um, call it terms, that um, we require people to abide by, but almost every single person that walks to the door has some unique need that they want to build into the contract. But we kind of try to stick to a, to a very um, simple plan every time, uh, or a simple set of rules that everyone has to abide by. Because you, you start creating um, unique contracts for tons and tons of people, it becomes a, a big issue. But as far as negotiating, um, you know, going back to Ryan's early comment, I think you need to kind of lay everything out on the table up front without trying to be um, cagey or hidden in terms of what you're trying to accomplish with, with your space, whether it's a commercial lease or residential lease. I think it's really about um, really outlining exactly what you intend. Um, to do and, and get done, or what you're trying to achieve in securing space. Um, but I think transparency is really important, and um, also having good legal advice, especially if you're doing something slightly out of the ordinary, just to have um, good backup in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. So, Jake, just to follow up a question, just a question on what you were saying, which is that. Uh, what you're saying, I think, is that you need to have flexibility in, in your approach when it comes to negotiating. But I would say, and I have a question for you regarding that, do you think that that inhibits you and your ability to grow what you're trying to accomplish as a result of trying to meet everyone's needs, or does that make it easier? Well, it, um, what we're trying to do is, is, again, find a model or a framework that applies for the most number of people. And, and right now, we have made a lot of custom contracts within our organization or our model in order to find that kind of sweet spot where we know it's going to fit for most people. Um, as well as people typically come in the door with a certain um, expectation of how they want to use something, um, just because of the legacy with which they used a, a, a resource before. Um, we always like to try to educate people on, I know you want to use it, I, want, I know you want to use that space in this way, but we've learned a ton from working over so many years with so many people that here's a, here's a great way to actually interface with space that you may not have, have thought of before. So you kind of leave um, your thinking aside for a second and experience it in a different way. Um, so, but we're really trying to find that framework that really works for as many people as possible so that we can create a standardized way with which artists interface with physical spaces. Um, you know, the same way a co-working space or like a WeWork has been able to scale a model based on a very simple membership framework. We create people and artists interface with spaces in a completely different way, and they also interface with each other in a completely different way. So you're, you're trying to take those two things into account when you're when you're sharing space. So you can see it outside. Of, I'm sorry. That's you okay. can see it outside of the uh, music space. It might turn into something other than music. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know we all like to compartmentalize ourselves, and you know it's music or visual arts or dance or performance art, whatever it is, but. Um, you know, we can all sit here and say some of us are creative and some of us are not, but we're all creative beings at the end of the day, and, and something that works for a, a musician will definitely work for anyone in the creative arts of any form, and it typically works for anybody, because it's just how human in, humans interact with, with the world, and um, we're all creative in some way, shape, or form. Um, so we're looking for uh, that framework um, to understand how creative people um, put their um, art into the world and how it gets received by other people and try to build a, a, a physical framework to have that work better with the spaces. It sounds a little spiritual, but it's important. <laughs> we'll take it. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go in a slightly different direction with this question. I'm really big on providing people with concrete steps that they can kind of take tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to go the tip-based approach. So again, tips like looking into licensing agreements for space, my tips around negotiations and opportunities to strengthen your skills around negotiations. And this will mostly focus on setting up your own spaces because that's 
primarily what I deal in. So something you can do tomorrow that you can start to think through how you can negotiate access on great terms for yourself to new spaces in a low risk way is, um, uh, so you guys are from Peterborough, right? So what's the main street called in Peterborough? Like what's one of the main? Uh, Water Street. Water Street. So tomorrow, or when you have time, just walk down Water Street, and if you see any vacant properties, take note of those properties, the address, um, ask people locally how long they've been vacant, if they've been vacant for two, five, ten years, and then go to your uh, local assessment rolls, and you can actually check the address of those property owners, and you can mail them a letter saying, your property's been vacant for this many years, we're able to um, help you upgrade your property by painting a wall, by fixing up the facade, by doing all sorts of things and trying to negotiate access to that space, trying to negotiate an entry point and don't just wait for um, a for lease sign to go up at a co-working space or for or an availability to come up at a co-working space. Don't wait for someone to give you a space. There are all sorts of opportunities throughout the city where you can negotiate access to spaces that you would not imagine that you'd be able to have access to. And this is kind of how I started doing this. And you get these responses saying, oh yeah, sure, you can have access to that space. It's vacant anyways, I'm not making any money from it. It is what it is kind of thing. And then I was like, oh shoot, this is actually working. So that's, I mean, it's, it sounds really silly and it sounds like why wouldn't they just leave it vacant? But sometimes people do want to have the space open or activated or whatever it is. They just don't have the time to do it. Maybe they inherited this storefront and they're just not there locally. They don't care. So I think you can also take steps to strengthen your own negotiation skills and don't wait till you're face to face with a landlord who's trying to offer you a lease. Go out and try to kind of make your own way in creating these unique arrangements and strengthening your own skill set. That would be my tip. What was the proper local assessment? Uh, so it's the assessment rules where they have the, unfortunately they don't provide phone numbers or email addresses, but they provide the um, physical address of the property owner and you can just send them a letter and you can explain to them that um, unoccupied spaces have higher insurance rates, unoccupied spaces are more likely to be subject to vandalism, to pest infestations, to arson, to graffiti, to just kind of do a Google search of things that happen to unoccupied spaces and listen for them. And let them know that you'll be on site and while you're there on site, you'll watch the space, you'll improve the space in little ways, take note of ways that you can improve the space, and try to negotiate your way in, like start negotiating yourself. Take a bit of a pitch. Yeah, essentially, and you would be surprised, again, when you don't wait for a landlord to hand you a deal and you bring that deal to them and it's a strong business case, you would be surprised by people who will open the doors for you. Sometimes it's for free, sometimes it's exchanged for paying just the property taxes, sometimes it's like a sweat equity kind of thing, so this is kind of the way that I often operate, I don't wait for those contracts to come up, I proactively search them out, and at this point it's a word of mouth thing where things come to me because people know I'm able to do these things, but you can just as easily go out and do the same thing tomorrow. I'll give you a, a real world example that I just reminded me. In our building we have an empty lot next door, it's a, it's a parking lot, and we always just, we saw it as a parking lot, but knew it'd be an amazing event space at some point where we had the resources to program it. Um, so we built a lot of planning towards, you know, uh, summer 2019, we're going to start our parking lot programming. Once, once every weekend, there's going to be a it'll be a live music, music venue. We'll have a food event. So at, during this planning, there was a restaurant down the street, and um, they came to us with exactly the same thing. Said, "We want to program your parking lot, and we'll bring all the resources. All we ask for is um, let us make the money that we're programming with, but we'll maintain it. We'll make sure everything gets cleaned up all the time. It was cost the same as parks. It was always filled with garbage." So, they said, and we said, we wanted the space to come alive anyways, we just didn't have the resources to get to it. And now, you know, we have a pretty steady slate of things that we just show up on the weekend and there's a party going on and it's been maintained and run by the professionals <laughs> and, and people that really want to do it. That's cool. What's that, Jordana? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for those amazing tips. Um, I have a question. Sure. Is it on the reverse side, is there an incentive to leave? 
So for just uh, repeat the question. The question was, is there an incentive to leave property vacant? Is that correct? So for a long time in the city of Toronto, there's been something called a vacant property tax rebate, which um, essentially would apply to um, properties like those storefronts that you would see that would be left vacant. And if they were vacant for more than, don't quote me because I'm just trying to, <laughs> 90 days, I believe they would get a fairly sizable rebate and it would essentially subsidize their, that vacancy. And that's because there are um, properties that we need in the city that go through vacancies in these seasonal ways and we don't want landlords to be so distressed that they then change that use on that site and we no longer have those kind of industrial properties that we need in the city. But that vacant property rebate tax also serves to have a lot of storefronts in um, kind of commercial areas stay vacant and um, create issues within the larger BIA, at least for BIAs that approached me, that was something that they flagged as a potential challenge that they're having, but that rebate tax just ended last year. So now it's creating a little bit of a fire under a lot of landlords. They know they won't get that rebate anymore, so it's better for them to actually find a tenant, but there has been that incentive for some time just to leave the property vacant. Right, in the neighborhood mm -hmm. where I live, there's at least 35 uh, empty retail spaces from yeah. Woodbine to Victoria Park. Mm -hmm. So the entire commercial area is yeah, and it's really difficult because, I mean, I also feel for the property owners sometimes, I mean, their property taxes are super high and they're having all these problems, so they really focus on finding these big commercial tenants who can sign multi-year deals, but the economy just is not there anymore. People aren't looking to start their business and lock themselves into a five-year commercial tenancy on Queen Street East, they're trying to figure things out. So it's harder for landlords to secure these tenants, but they're just waiting for them. So they won't take in that artist who will say, for one year, I'll create this amazing gallery, or that baker who says, I want to set up this pop-up restaurant. They're waiting for that five-year big budget tenant. So that's sort of another um, bottleneck in this so sort of- Some of the properties too are under legal issues, like insurance claims. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to want to be careful if you're looking exactly. to get into that. Yeah. So it's interesting because a lot of people see empty spaces and they, so a lot of people like on the face of it, my work just looks like there's an empty space, yes. we need a space, you go in the space, <laughs> but there's legal, financial, insurance related things like that it goes on. So I will say it's not, it's not at all as easy as it seems and with churches it's 10 times harder. So. Um, although there are all these vacant spaces, as you pointed out, there are sometimes incentives to leave them empty, and at other times there are um, burdens on the properties that would just be too much for you to take on. So, yeah. We do you want to come back to Ryan to get his thoughts as well? But I see some questions over here that to hear what they are. Should we ask them? Thanks. Um, just commenting on a couple of things, including um, how you negotiate and so on. Part of the reason some space stays vacant is because some building owners regard tenants as trouble. They've either had problems with tenants in the past, and this is both residential tenants and commercial tenants. So I think one of the things that you need to think about is how you're not going to, you're not only not going to be trouble, but you're going to actually help them. And um, your business idea will work for them. The other factor, of course, especially these days in Toronto, is a lot of building owners are waiting for redevelopment. They're waiting for someone to offer them big money for the property in the land assembly. They're looking, they're waiting for some rezoning approvals to happen. So, you know, it's challenging and I think that's where people who want stuff short term are at a big advantage because they can say, well, I only want it for the next six months or whatever. Um, so you're not locking yourself into anything. That's actually a really good point. Um, so uh, 
A lot of properties that aren't on the MLS, they're not on the market, they're kind of sitting vacant, and whether it be because people are waiting for redevelopment opportunities and they're holding on to them in that way, a lot of these properties, if you're able to make a case for temporary use, especially through licensing agreements, people are afraid of leases, because they feel like, even if you tell them, your properties, if I'll just have your property for a month and we're doing this pop-up and whatever, they feel like you're, you'll overstay and you'll go back on that agreement, but if you can say to them, give me the property for a month, we have this licensing agreement, this is what it looks like, they're more open to that. And there's a lot of interesting sites beyond churches and retail storefronts. There's pre-construction condo sites that have like buildings that just sit on them while developers go through these permissions processes and they're just sitting there vacant and you're able to have them temporarily oftentimes if you present a good business case, as you said, or present a case that allows them to understand how you'll work with them or um, at least leave their site better than you found it. Mm -hmm. There's another question in the back, right? Actually, this is just an example that I thought might be helpful. Last year, there was a TV series called Mary Porta's Queen of Shops. I don't know if any of you have seen it or are familiar. It's Mary Porter's from the UK. Uh, she went because a lot of these stores in certain communities were closing down because of the downturn of the economy. So she would go to uh, a place that um, and speak to the shop owners and the council and get together and put together a plan. Um, and I'm sure if you Google it, it'll come up. And um, it actually helped the community with the empty storefronts and they decide certain weekend, everyone's gonna contribute, they're gonna clean up the streets, they're gonna paint and do everything. And as a community, they come together and um, have um, places that they could actually have their produce and their, um, the artists could present their things and all of them contribute. And the council would contribute with not having them pay any rent um, because it helped with the crime and um, with any other problems with the garbage and things. So it really gave good advice. Um, and so I'm sure if you Google it, it will come up. And um, it's all the same um, problems you all might face. So I just thought that might be something you would be interested in looking into. Thank you. Ryan, do you want to jump in? Um, well, there's a lot of questions there. I, to, uh, I might have a, I don't want to waylay you, but um, we've been talking quite a bit about you know working in living spaces, but I think it's really important to spend a little bit of time on commercial leases specifically, or licenses, because you know in law we always say it's the wild, wild west where these types of agreements are. No rules that protect you. It's not the same as residential leases. So while we have you, Brian, a commercial real estate expert here, can we get some great legal advice? What are some you know key clauses that would be really important for folks not to overlook, or whatever you think we should know? Well, I mean, there's a, a there's a lot, and I'd say that I've seen a wide array of, of commercial leases. Um, what you do want, to, what you want to try and look for, are specifically issues around rent and default. That would be my first tip, because uh, as I've mentioned before, if a landlord wants to penalize you for default under a commercial least so you need to do any number of things. So you want to look very carefully at those sections of those uh, of those leases. Uh, you also want to look at use if you're worried or your interest if you're if, if you have specific uh, ideas about what you plan to do and those ideas tend to be diverse. You're going to want to make sure that the use that he's uh, expecting or she's expecting is uh, not in, in con is, is not in conflict with what you're intending on doing there. Uh, you can very easily overlook that because 
you may not anticipate that down the road, you know, you, you're going to throw a show, and that show may may have music that you want to include, and that music now may be loud, and as and and there's some specific outlines in the lease about decibel levels of music. I mean, you just you may not foresee that, but what you really need to do is think very carefully about what kinds of use are going to be allowed uh, long term. Uh, in terms of other sections, I mean, I think that it, it really, I mean, I think it will vary from, from individual to individual, depending on what your needs are. Uh, as an example, I mean, I did have, I'm thinking back to somebody that was going to be leasing a commercial space, intending on having a small shop, a coffee shop in this space. But then when I asked a question about levels of music, for instance, uh, and what was going to be going on there, when you really start to look at it, it was not really a coffee shop. It was more like maybe a, maybe a bar, and there was going to be some art exhibits. So, you know, it's, you, you got to get real clear on what it is that your use is, and you want to make sure that that's clearly outlined in your, in your commercial tenancy. Um, I would say as well, you want to look at terms for length of time that you're going to be staying in a, in a commercial space. If you're intending on using something for a very short term, you don't want to get locked into a commercial lease. And I think there's another lawyer at the table here, and I know she's agreeing with what I'm saying for sure, because uh, if, if you're locked in for a, on a commercial lease, usually that's for a five-year period uh, with a very, very strict or strict terms on, on extending that term for a period of time or finding someone else to assign that lease to. So you get real locked in. So I would say you got to be real careful about that. And this is where I would say Joanna is totally right about licensing. Licensing is a good <laughs> option if you're thinking about one specific or a few specific events that you're going to do or if you're thinking about using a space in one area of a building for a period of time, you definitely should say, listen, I don't want to sign a lease with you that it's not my plan. I just want to be here for, you know, I want to be here for four or five months. I've got an idea. I want to use maybe two rooms in this building. Will you allow me to do that? And then we can put together, maybe we put together a licensing agreement. We put that to the landlord instead. Right. So those are my tips. The longest term I've seen with a commercial lease was 25 years. Yeah, I've seen those. So too. it can be the last well best, as, as I said. But yeah, five, five years would be super common. I think another really crazy clause that I've come across as well in the commercial lease zone is um, accelerated rent. And correct me if I'm wrong about any of this, Brian, but has anyone ever seen that in a lease before, accelerated rent? Okay. We'll look out for that in any agreement that you you might enter into. And what that usually means is if you happen to default on your lease, not only do you have to pay what you owe to that point, but it would accelerate everything that you could owe for the rest of the five years or to up to 25 years. Um, and people go bankrupt because they have signed agreements like that. So so don't don't sign, don't agree to an accelerated rent yeah. laws, I would say, under, under any circumstance. Um, so I, correct me if I'm no, you're, you're, you're completely right. I mean, I, I recently looked at a lease um, for someone renting a studio, actually. They were uh, looking at it for, they wanted to be there for an extended period of time, potential to work, circumstances. And as one of the provisions was that at the end of the term, or if there was a default within the term, that there would be not only would your rent be accelerated, it would be doubled. So you would end up having to pay double your rent in order like, if you defaulted on your rent. I mean, I understand that, you know, landlords are, are paranoid, they're worried, they want you to pay your rent and they want to penalize you, but that's an example of some of the stuff you'd see. I don't know that that was, I mean, that wasn't going to stay in that lease, but I mean, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that you may see and you may sign off on and not realize. Saying Dave about Signal using a digital platform in some of the work that it does. So I thought it might be 
might be worth talking about. We talked about some current trends, the licensing, and, and other types of stuff. But um, maybe you could tell us about what role of technology might play in making spaces more accessible and affordable to artists, or if technology doesn't work for the other panelists as well, any other current trends that we should know about. Yeah, I'd love to talk about technology. I'm a huge <laughs> fan. Um, that's why I got in the music business, because I saw what a computer could do to uh, subvert those giant tape machines. Um, and it's interesting because when we looked at one of the biggest issues, especially with um, music spaces and, and performance spaces or um, studios, if you think about like a large studio, you might be occupying 400 square, foot, square feet with a single engineer in downtown Toronto. So there's, there's a lot of space being occupied by very few people. So one of the things we looked at with technology is how do you get more people through the same amount of space. So, um, you know, for uh, really changing the paradigm around those spaces so that technology will allow more people to use the right space at the right time. So if you had you know, four studios and typically, you know, a person would eat a studio eight hours a day, could we figure out a way to get way more people through those spaces? So really, there's a, there was a process of, um, learning how people use those spaces and then using technology to actually kind of handhold people through a bit of a different process to um, so we just get more people through those, through those spaces. So it's really about, um, you know, we had people come through the doors saying, I need student space and I have money to rent the space and how much is it about? And I'm like, well, we don't actually rent spaces about, about a month because the problem is if you sit in that room, uh, and it's a valuable studio in downtown Toronto, you might spend half the time emailing and doing your marketing and you know, Facebook, and, and it's a valuable studio. So you, you have this amazing cafe space, do all your marketing up there, but when you need to use a studio, come down and use a studio. Um, and you know, most people are like, well, uh, so it's a bit of an education process, and, and technology is there to, to aid in that um, process. So it's really about, okay, um, I need to book a studio. Okay, so what are you doing in that studio? And the platform's designed to ask you what you're doing in the studio and then refer you to, here's a great space to do exactly that, and here's how many hours you need to do exactly that, and I will plug you into that space and you can rent it by the hour. Um, and so that's how um, technology can, can help inform and then help uh, handle people through the process of booking, walking in, access control, um, giving people tips on how to use the space effectively, how to work more effectively, more productive, um, and then with the whole goal of instead of now one person being that, in that room um, for the month, we can you know push 40 people to the same room because now we have all these um, other spaces that accommodate people in ways. Um, and then it's really about um, connecting creators together to utilize spaces together and collaborate together in spaces. So, you know, a lot of um, people are sharing single studios, so they'll share four or five artists will share one studio on a studio monthly basis. And how you take that notion of um, people coming together to utilize spaces and creating um, teams that then take the same concept and plug into spaces more on an hourly basis and a per use and per need basis. Uh, and that's where we've been focusing on how technology can do that. And then obviously once, um, technology is really easy to scale. Real estate is very, very difficult to scale. Um, and one of the issues, especially in the music industry, is that every studio space and music space and performance space is almost unique, and it's this it's a unique case so that, you know, if you're an engineer, if you're a sound engineer, you have to go to the studio, you have to learn that room, because no other room is like that. And every room you go into, there's this process of you getting used to the room. Um, and that's fundamentally a problem when, um, there's so many freelancers in the industry that are flowing through different spaces, and every time they walk into a space, they're like, I need five to 10 hours just to get used to how this room works, the equipment-wise, the room, what's the sound like, what the speaker sound like. Um, and trying to develop um, a model or uh, a workflow that can be more standardized across the board. So if you open up um, a space or a studio, there's a resource or a tool or a platform that you can use to standardize that space so that um, as the community grows and they walk into these type of spaces, there's always some, there's some conformity. And that's one of the big problems is there's so many independents, there's no conformity to the, to the, to the community. Is that technology platform not an off-shelf solution or something you developed? So the question is, is there a 
question there was, is that technology off the shelf or was that something that you developed, is that right? So what we started by um, connecting several off the shelf um, software platforms using their APIs to, to really start um, the learning process of how specifically music and sound professionals interface with spaces. And that's what we've been using up until now. And we've just started building our own proprietary software based on the data that we've collected over there. So that's, um, you know, we hope to go down the road with that to create something scalable and then distribute that so people can utilize those tools to, to bring spaces online um, and know that they can plug into a wider network and know that they're using data that when they build that space, there's a growing community that, that can interface with it very efficiently, very quickly. Um, so similar to Dave, I also use online platforms to mobilize people around spaces. So last year, we launched an online platform to do this on the activatespace.ca website where you're able to go on, you can recommend spaces in your community that can use a little bit of attention, you can find other local people who can participate in those sorts of activations. But other than that, I'm not here to promote my own sort of thing. I'm here for to give you guys tips essentially on how to do this. A technology that everyone uses and has often been really helpful for me, Twitter. Um, so if you go to, if you're in Peterborough and you find that vacant property that you know has been vacant for years, I'm sure there's a local BIA, a local counselor, all sorts of people who also would like to see it activated or just made more vibrant. So find your people. Don't feel like you have to do these projects alone because when you see this property and you know it's an issue, there's probably 20 more people behind you who see the same thing. Twitter is something that you can do and there's also ways that you can set up your own co-working spaces tomorrow through white label softwares for free. So go online, search white label co-working space software or platforms and it essentially lets you do what we work does. It essentially lets you do what I can do or Dave could do just to set up that initial platform and to get people in your community connected to that space, make sure that you have a good licensing agreement for people who use that space that you set up in your beautiful storefront that was once vacant in Peterborough. So these are things, again, that you can do tomorrow. You can set up your own space again, make sure that that agreement is airtight, and um, but these are things that are available to everyone in terms of the technology that exists. Yeah, we started with a very, very inexpensive co-working platform, so you can find them, they're virtually free, and it, it actually handholds you through a lot of that set of process. So. I didn't mean to give away the secret sauce, but I'm okay, no. just like, I don't no, know. No, no, it's, yeah, 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 there's no secret sauce, but okay. to get, I mean, it's really about the, the, the people that you're serving, but the tools to get started are all there, and they're all available for, for next to nothing. Great. We've got some questions. Uh, not necessarily a question. Uh, I'll be pretty loud. Okay. Uh, be quiet. Um, not necessarily a, a question, but just wondering if um, there's a couple of sites that work like that. I'm, I think Airbnb has started making experiences, but there's also something called Arbory um, that, that uses people sign up. Like they're like, I have a space, I own a laundry mat, I own sofa store, I have a big house, and and people are like, I need a space, and they kind of come together like that. I'm wondering what the thoughts are like that, um, if there's anything, um, if um, what you're doing is sort of similar to that, or, or um, yeah, just what your thoughts of those kind of platforms are. Yeah, th that's essentially how it works. I mean, for me, I have my big institutional clients that I work with, so in addition to that, I just help people who need the advice and can learn from what I've done to set up their own spaces, and that's, it's a social enterprise, so I'm big on the social part of it. I'm just trying to share the good advice that I've received and that I've learned over time, because why not? Um, so, there are, again, white label softwares for that sort of Airbnb experience as well that you can set up. But I will say, again, in setting up those sorts of spaces, uh, so for example, a space that I set up not too long ago was this um, kitchen incubator space. And there's a lot of concerns when you have people who are chefs that are looking for affordable spaces that they can't afford these five-year commercial leases because they're transitioning from being in a kitchen to setting up their first 
bakery or whatever it may be. So if you're having someone in a space that you have some sort of legal relationship to, and they're in there, and they're with knives, and they're frying things, and they're, it's a different sort of risk that's occurring in that space than if someone's in a residential space through Airbnb. When you're doing this sort of thing with commercial spaces, you yourself, if you're leading this initiative, need to figure out how to externalize some of those externalize or mitigate some of those risks that occur by having people in your commercial space, whether that's a kitchen with knives and fire and whatever, or if it's your gallery space. So I will say in setting up these spaces, the software there, the spaces are vacant and they're available. Also think about the risk that exists in those spaces. Think about insurance related concerns and what you'd be requiring of those people that are coming into the space or what you'd be taking on yourself. And so these are again things that although empty space, people need space, you can connect them. There's also a number of things that I would recommend that you look into either through legal representation or people who have done this and are willing to share information with you. Yeah, one of the biggest challenges for us when we had, you know, we were planning having up to 500 members flow through the space was really that terms and conditions because even our insurance company very quickly said, okay, you've got a whole different um, class of use now that this the doors are open 24 seven and you're, you're not gonna watch every single person that goes through there. So you really have to have a, that kind of button down. Um, it's important because you know, in the middle of the night you don't know who's using the space and, and insurance-wise insurance -wise it can be dicey. So did you curate people that use the space there or is that, uh, is it just sort of anybody can approach you and enter in like a WeWork space. And I, I think it's the same question for both of you, actually. I'm wondering whether, how do you go about curating who would be in these spaces? Is, it, is there a way in which you do that? Well, I guess my approach is a little bit um, different because I, I don't um, sort of focus on individuals. It's about big organizations that would be in spaces. So I partner with big organizations. And um, in terms of curating them, I mean, I'm big on social procurement. I'm big on um, creating opportunities that meet local need with local artists. So I look at the reputation of those arts organizations. I look at their annual reports. And I look at how they spend their money, if they're giving back, what they do in the community. And those are the sorts of artists and the sorts of arts groups that I'm looking to provide these affordable spaces that are, again, rare in the city. So maybe it's just an ethical thing. I'm not looking to just pair those spaces with people who could afford space anywhere and who might not be giving back to the community and might not be, um, might not benefit from or be able to leverage or utilize these spaces in a way that an organization that does have that active giving built into what they already do. So I guess that would be my only, um, criteria or way of curating these spaces? It's interesting. We, we effectively do the same thing. And you mentioned uh, you know, organizations that um, contribute to the community. And we, we um, like the space is just the vessel. The, the makeup of people within that space is really what drives the energy, what drives the engagement, what drives the, the activation. So curating the right group of people to utilize that space creates that energy. And for us, it's it is a curation process, but we've always said that any member that wants to join our, our current um, location is really about um, are they bringing benefit to the community or are they going to benefit from the community? Because we have to um, create a situation where the group of people are kind of greater than the sum of parts. Uh, so we, we do a curation process. It's really not about who can afford that. Is because we look at the makeup of the community as it stands, and if someone asks for access to the space, it's like, are you going to benefit? Are we going to benefit from you? Do you, do you fit the complement of people here? And I think that's an important part of the cur curation. It's, it is less about, are you can afford it so you can come, come in. That's really not how we're building our community because um, when you have the makeup right, like there's so many people that walk into the space and they've gotten three feet in the door and they're like, wow, this place is a great vibe. The vibe is because of the paint color or the furniture. It's, it's the people that are there and the energy that's happening there, and so that's one of the most important thing we're trying to create because that's how we get to support those people within there. Dan was saying we had one more question. Is that so? You have a question, right? Uh, so one of the things uh, you 
all kind of talked about was mitigating risk. Um, and so there was a suggestion that you know if anyone wanted to set up a, their own co-working space tomorrow, it's pretty easy. You can go online, grab some software, grab some friends, <laughs> you know, share the space. <laughs> Finding a group of people who want to work on a project together um, can raise some, I guess, legal risks. And I know there's different ways that groups of people can come together to organize themselves to, to work towards a common goal. They could set up a not-for-profit, they can incorporate, they might be able to set up a co-op. Uh, could you, maybe right away, talk about you know, what these different vehicles are and how they can be used and how you might want to use them specifically when it comes to uh, entering a space and setting up like a, a group of people together to work on kind of a common common goal. Good question. Brian, you sure. Off? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, so the, the, they're, they're definitely, a, you want to consider the vehicles that you can use and look at uh, the, uh, the main objectives that you have in mind for what you're trying to set up. I mean, yes, you could, you, you could do as, uh, uh, you know, you, you could go online and figure out who it is that you're going to work with, but what, what is that structure going to look like? Well, first you have to ask yourself, I think, whether or not what you're trying to do is for, uh, with an objective of profit. And if the objective isn't profit, then you can explore some of these these vehicles, uh, like a, a not-for-profit uh, organization. And even within that context, um, you can structure things so that uh, even though there's going to be funding that comes in, it, that, that funding in some way is the result of members being on board. So if everybody is coming in and is going to be contributing, you could set things up as a as a not for profit where you are, are trying to acquire members. Um, on the other hand, if you're looking to set something up where you're trying to make a profit with everybody that you've got in mind and you're going to put something together, and member a membership base isn't necessarily the objective, but you want to. Uh, you, you want to make a profit, you want to make a living off of what you're doing, I would say that uh, you do have the option then of, uh, of uh, incorporating and partnering and uh, doing things kind of in a very traditional legal sense. Um, some of the advantages, I think, of uh, not-for-profit approaches is that you can be to me, I think it has an advantage, and I think Elena, you might have, you might have uh, a little bit more uh, background on this, but I would think that uh, you're afforded the ability to offer something to the community um, as a whole, and offer it not because you're interested in making money off of anyone necessarily, but because you want to give back to that community. Um, and so I, I mean, uh, that's kind of one of the benefits of doing things this way. Uh, but I like it. No, I agree. I just the only two cents I would add is I think that a not-for-profit organization, if it suits the circumstances, is a really, really great option that's available to artists and creatives in in a way that is it's not as available in many other industries um, because of how the law regards art and art making and that type of stuff. So. Um, we're speaking a lot tonight about working together, sharing space, co-working, that type of stuff. And, and those types of relationships can lend themselves really well to a not-for-profit. It's pretty cheap to set up, but it does give you some legal protection as well, such as if the not-for-profit was the party listed on the lease rather than you personally. So there are definitely benefits. It's you know, as with everything we're talking about, it's too much to, to get into the meat of tonight, but, but a good idea to kind of plant in your head and, and revisit later. Um, I think it's a great option. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important as well to, to realize that you can get online and partner with people and put things together. You don't need to set up a corporate or not-for-profit structure in order to uh, 
to partner if you're going to do it on a very small level. I'd say that there are ways in which that, that can be done. Uh, but again, I mean, I think it's, it's important that we keep in mind that everyone's going to have different needs, so it's really important that you get those needs out onto the table, find a group of people that, you know, that are like-minded in terms of your objectives with what it is that you're trying to build, and, uh, and go from there. Yeah, I would say along the same lines, I'm sort of a lean startup kind of person, so test out what your minimum viable product is, test out your idea, be an unincorporated collective for a while before you go legally tying yourself to other people. Don't be afraid to be a sole proprietor. Just get the ball rolling on things in a responsible way, obviously. Um, and then once you can assess that there's some value there or what the arrangement should be between those, between you and those people, obviously look into a nonprofit, some sort of contractual agreement or corporation, but don't be afraid to go out there and just start doing the thing you want to do. That might not be, that might not be popular advice. Even as a lawyer, <laughs> I think that is great advice, you know, like don't let these concerns hold you back. And I think the reason for gatherings like this is to, you know, build community confidence and you know, see all the resources that we all have available to us, and we shouldn't be held back by fears. We should be aware of them, and you know, keep them in mind as we move forward. But I totally agree. <laughs> How are we doing for time? More questions? Are there more questions? We have lots of others we can go through, or or if there are questions from the audience at all, sure. That's it. Basic question is about a not for profit doesn't operate to earn profit, but how do they, they, they get income from, I guess, government programs? Yeah, so government or granting authorities would be some of the ways that a not for profit can earn revenue. The big difference, like, people can still be paid to work in a not for profit and, and all those things. It's just there's no shareholders in a not for profit, so someone isn't just getting you know, passive income from from those structures um, so you could still make a living and work and you know rent services or sell things and all those types of stuff there are limits to what you can do in the not-for-profit scheme um, but that's the big key that there's there are no shareholders who are just getting profit by not working in the organization yeah and I mean I, I, I it's important to know too that just because there aren't shareholders doesn't mean that you don't have a central control in which that organization will operate. I mean, there will there'll be individuals that are, are members of that organization that will have a say. Um, so it's not the same as a board of directors to exactly, although some not for profits can have boards of directors. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's still controlled by a membership base essentially. Yeah, um, I mean, not for profit is kind of, or non profit is kind of a misnomer. They make money, they just don't distribute it amongst their shareholders, as you said, and there are a lot of non profits that make a great deal of money, even more than for profit corporations. And an interesting thing that I've also found in my work is there are a lot of for profit organizations that are purpose driven or occupy this kind of social enterprise space. So there's some ways beyond the legal barriers that are clear that the boundaries between Nonprofits and for profits are kind of a little bit more blurry these days. So, if you have this great idea and you are a for profit corporation, you can find ways through your um, corporate social responsibility or through your own mandate that you're still able to give back and do those sort of charitable things and have that be a part of your core organization and your core mandate and not necessarily feel like you have to default to nonprofit because you have a social or purpose driven mission that would be my only advice we're trying to figure out what's the best fit for your organization or your situation any other questions from the floor i was thinking a bit about you know again we're talking about co and sharing and, and all these types of all these types of relationships and um, I'd be curious to hear from the panelists about maybe more tips around how to foster good relationships when we're working with others. I know that's a very broad <laughs> question, but I, that's an area where we all can learn from, from each other's experiences as well. 
We will start with Ryan at the end because I know we have. Here, so, I'm sorry, but can you just can you repeat the question? Uh, tips for fostering good working relationships, especially in the context of talking about shared and co-working relationships. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's important at the uh, again. I mean, I think it's important at the outset to have a clear sense of who it is that you're working with. Make a very concerted, concerted effort to uh, to figure out exactly whether. The people that you decide to work with are really people that you are going to be okay disagreeing with long term, coming to a resolution, negotiating things out. Because you know, I, I do think there's a lot of a lot of people have trepidation about partnering and working with others. And I would say that um, what you need to do is be careful that, or, or understand exactly who it is that you're working with and make a decision, a firm decision that as to whether or not this person versus person X is going to fit into what it is that I'm, that what you're trying to build. So I suppose what that really is about is understanding what your mission is and uh, trying to get people on board that are in line with that mission as best as possible. Um, so I'd say in terms of good working relationships, one of the things is, I mean, for me, I think about this is gonna sound a little bit crazy, but I think about worst case possible scenario, just like all out fallout between me and that person, and having something in place that guides us and what happens when that, if that happens. So having a positive relationship is about the day to day, but it's also about having a clear understanding of what happens if something goes wrong, because it's all fun and games and great setting up the space when things are going great. But when things go wrong, they can go really wrong. And sometimes when you have that idea of what would happen, worst case scenario, it allows you to navigate your relationship more thoughtfully because you know, oh shoot, so if we dissolve this partnership, this is what it's going to look like. So it's good to have that, I don't know if this is like a pessimistic way of going into things, but have something set up that allows you guys to know, worst case scenario, this is how we dissolve things, this is how we problem solve, this is how we partner with others if we're looking to expand, like have that set of rules in place. And I find when you have those standards, you have that set of rules in place, you can actually negotiate or navigate your relationship day to day in a more positive way because you have those things set. And set those things up when you're in a happy space. Don't all of a sudden you set them up when you're in a bad space and realize, oh, okay, now we don't know how we're gonna resolve this. And there's some animus between you guys. So. That's how I make sure that my relationships stay happy in terms of these projects, is just to have a basic understanding of what this is about and how we would move forward if something did go wrong. I agree with both you guys, and I'll just speak to more of the co-share sharing situation, where you're in a space with a lot of different people uh, that you may not know, you may not be in a business relationship with, but you're, you're in your sharing physical space. Um, I'm a huge proponent, I think all of us as human beings are to an extent, of like rules, 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 and, and adapting rules on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, because uh, a lot of things that, a lot of ways that we typically operate and think are, are common courtesy or common knowledge, but um, spelling things out, even the most mundane things, is an important part of the process to say, here's the way our community operates, here's kind of our best practices, even down to the you know, when we don't, I can't think of some mundane rule of practice, but um, rules are, are really important, and those rules need to evolve as that group of people evolves and that working relationship evol evolves, because then everyone knows you know, how to conduct themselves within a space. What does that mean? <laughs> May I have your attention, please? <laughs> New York Gallery of Ontario is closing in 50 minutes. So we have 50 minutes 50 to get visiting the ATO. <laughs> Uh, so rules, yeah, and, and, and having that communicated very efficiently, whether it's posted somewhere or it's easily distributed, it's, it's, it's on an FAQ page and, and everyone can see that. Like I, I, there's a funny story of um, uh, a community manager in a space that said at one point there was 37 signs um, with a various bunch of things on it in a, in a reception area just to guide people on how to conduct themselves within that reception area. Because, and, and, 
And it's an important thing because people like to walk into a space and go and know how to conduct themselves right away and, and know how to you know, interface with people. I think that's an important part of that. Definitely. I think one myth that I encounter a lot is, oh, this is my friend, or where's my family member, and what could ever go wrong? And those are often the most uh, toxic outcomes from from a, a dispute between between parties working together. Um, and I hate to be pessimistic looking at these things, but I think it's just a case of being real. You know, what could happen, and what does that mean? And yes, oh my goodness, deal with that. You know, when things are still sunny and feeling good and like each other still. It's in case of being a lawyer, right? That's what you're <laughs> Yeah, I was actually going to mention that because there's this feeling of when you're coming together to make a collaborative workspace or um, just a collaboration, um, there a lot of people, I find a lot of artists are afraid of contracts. They almost feel like they're, like it's an insult to their person. If you're asking to sign this contract, it's just like laying out rules and laws and like what happens if everything sets on fire? Um, but do you do you suggest um, when you're when you're creating a, a workspace or a collaboration? Do you suggest having that that in place just you know well, in case something happens? Yeah, I think there's a few different levels of rule setting that you can explore. So you can have like some sort of memorandum of understanding. You can have, like you don't have to go to the highest level as soon as someone walks through the door, but you can kind of figure out ways that you can put those rules in place. And there's a variety of legal tools that you can make use of to put rules in place. So again, there's all sorts of contract documents, there's all sorts of ways of approaching this that perhaps are a little less <laughs> formal or harsh. And that could even be a, a mandate or some sort of agreement that exists within the organization, even though unofficial having those rules written down does something. Like so there's ways of doing this that don't go to that very formal rate or place immediately. But again, like having those unofficial rules, having a memorandum of understanding, having all sorts of contracts in place, leases, licensing, like I'm sure this is kind of opened your eyes to the range of possibilities that you can have in these spaces. I would say as well that, you know, I, I know that um, artists are nervous about it, but I would say that once you get it in place, you'll find that there, there's a lot less nervousness about what, what, what was to happen or what is potentially to happen if something happens, if something goes wrong, right? So, yeah, I mean, uh, the nervousness on the front end makes a lot of sense, but you want to relieve the pressure with everyone. It's to really get clear on that those elements and just get them dealt with and get them out of the way, right? Um, and the thing about it is too, is my experience with artists is is that as they're more experienced, they, they become more and more involved in collaborative work, more and more involved with, in the case of bands, you know, more and more involved with different elements of, let's say, uh, of, of the music industry. The first thing they look to would be, let's try and get a relationship contract in place so I understand what's happening here. Because, you don't want there to be a confusion about that on the, on the back end. That's when things really go sideways, legally speaking. Yeah, and there can be a, you know, a really good opportunity in, rather than something to be afraid of, but the opportunity to sit down and say, like, here's what I'm looking for, what are you looking for? Do, do those things line up? And that could be scary because the answers might not line up, but better to know that earlier rather than, than later. And, and there's also cases, legally speaking, where even if you don't have a contract in place, the law could deem certain things, could infer certain, could impose certain rules on you, even if you have never written anything down. So all the more reason to try to be you know, conscious and intentional about these things. And I know we're about to get kicked out very soon. So any final last words from any of our wonderful panelists before we shut things down? Um, so my only last words would be oftentimes when we think about alternative spaces in the city and alternative space opportunities for artists, it's framed as you wait for people to set up those spaces and you guys flock to them. Take this as an opportunity to look into ways that you can set up your own spaces, be confident about it, be creative in it. I mean, you're artists, you guys are kind of made for this kind of work, if any, to 
take these creative approaches to launching these spaces and partnering with people and just don't be afraid to do it. Don't wait till that opportunity is handed to you in terms of space. Go out there and do it. That would be my only last words. And I'm going to follow that up with saying that even large developers, um, medium-sized developers, landowners, are very, very culturally attracted to activating their spaces with the arts in some form because it, they need to tell a story now that's a lot better than look at all the comedy we just built. That something needs to happen to bring energy to these spaces. And so they're all looking for a story to tell and they want to interface with artists. They, they, don't, they themselves don't know how to do it efficiently. Um, so it's important to get out there and, and, and present yourself. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think that uh, you really got to approach, just not, don't be afraid to voice the idea and try and bring it to life. Uh, you know, um, uh, I'd say that you might think that it's it's like a, a huge challenge to maybe get your, your work, your art out. It's probably easier to get money than you might imagine, and also easier to get your easier to get your art into the space that you're hoping to, or at least something similar. It's just a matter of reaching out, right, a lot of times. Um, and uh, I, I just say, there's not really any reason that you should be afraid of that. Get out there and do it. Sounds Joanna, so Dave, geez, Brian, thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it over to you. Yeah, so, and thank you, Elena, for moderating the panel and for the speakers for participating. A uh, couple of final points before everyone leaves the night. Um, our next, so as we kind of mentioned at the beginning, this is the second of a four-part series uh, with the AGO and OCAD. So again, thank you to the AGO for hosting us last time. For this time, our next two panels are going to be hosted at OCAD, right across the street from here, so it's not going to be confusing to get there. Uh, Taking the summer off, we're back in September. End of September, we're doing a whole talk on artist contracts. Uh, so that'll probably be very interesting. Uh, we'll probably get a couple different perspectives on it. Um, and after that, we're doing one more in November of this year about setting up a professional practice. And uh, I think we'll probably get into a bit more in that talk about what it means to operate as a sole proprietorship if you just want to open up a shop, or what are considerations when it comes to incorporating <laughs> Taxes, what are those? Questions like that. We'll all be addressed in that last one in November. So I hope you can come back. You'll probably get an email from us uh, if you've attended one of our sessions already. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you there. So have a great night. I'm sure the panelists will stay around until they kick us out. Uh, and if you have any questions about Alas, please come see me. Thanks again.